So we are living in a unique time. And uh, given our current circumstances, um, being in self-isolation and uh, many people working from home, school canceled, missionaries uh, returning from their missions, and uh, uh, in Utah, an earthquake, um, a lot of Latter-day Saints are wondering if these events are related in some way to the second coming. And I think especially a lot of young people have some fear about what's going on and and uh, and kind of what the second coming is. And so I wanted to just uh, go through and, and really essentially kind of define uh, what the second coming is. And so uh, hopefully this this video will will help um, bring some understanding and some peace and uh, uh, help us understand what to look for and what the second coming is. Um, so in Doctrine and Covenants 45, verse 44, uh, the Lord says this, And then they shall look for me, and behold, I will come, and they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with glory, or clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels, and he that watches not for me shall be cut off. So the Lord's instructing us that we should be paying attention, we should be watching, and and paying attention to the signs. This is something we ought to care about. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said this in his book, The Millennial Messiah. There's not a more important course to pursue for any of us who live, who now live on the earth than to prepare for the second coming. The gospel has been restored and the great Latter-day Kingdom has been established in order to prepare a people for that dreadful yet glorious day. Okay, and then uh, Elder Dallin H. Oaks, he was he's president of Oaks now, was, was uh, Elder Oaks in April 2004. General Conference. Uh, four matters are indisputable to Latter-day Saints. One, the Savior will return to the earth in power and great glory to reign personally during a millennium of righteousness and peace. Two, at the time of his coming there will be a destruction of the wicked and a resurrection of the righteous. Three, no one knows the time of his coming, but four, the faithful are taught to study the signs of it and to be prepared for it. So why bother? Why bother to study about the second coming? Uh, it's a very common um, understanding among Latter-day Saints and other Christians that no one knows when the Savior will come again, and that's based on Matthew twenty-four thirty-six, uh, where the Savior says, "But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only." So, in the doctrinal New Testament commentary by Bruce R. McConkie, he writes this. Question, does or will anyone know when the Lord will come? Answer, as to the day and hour, no. As to the generation, yes. Question, who shall know the generation? Answer, the saints, the children of light, those who can read the signs of the times, those who treasure up the Lord's word so they will not be deceived. Paul told the Thessalonians that the coming of the Lord would be as travail upon a woman with child, that where people of the world are concerned, Jesus would come as a thief in the night, that is unexpectedly and without warning, but that where the children of light are concerned, the Lord would not come as a thief in the night, for they are aware of the times and seasons connected with his return. Thus, though the saints do not know the day, they are aware of the season. As a woman in travail feels the pains of the approaching birth, so the saints read the signs of the times, neither knows the exact moment of the anticipated happening, but both know the approximate time. So it's not as though we're completely in the dark and just have no idea and it could just be at any moment. If we will pay attention, if we are watching, and if we know the signs and we watch for them, uh, we can know at least the approximate time. Many Latter-day Saints and other Christians expect the Second Coming to occur as one great and terrible event. They imagine life as it is now being suddenly interrupted, by calamitous destruction, and then the clouds opening up and Jesus descending to the earth. A careful study of the scriptures, however, paints a much different picture. In reality, the Savior's second coming will be a multi-phased process, including several preliminary appearances to his people before he comes in glory to the whole world. So uh, I want to talk about what some of those preliminary appearances are and, and what this looks like. Uh, it can be kind of confusing as you read the scriptures, um, you read about the Savior coming um, 
you know, on the Mount of Olives and, and saving the Jews and, and uh, to his temple and, and here and there and then coming in glory and, and the millennium begins. And it, it can be kind of confusing uh, if, if your understanding is that it's a singular event. So we're going to walk through some of these. So a little background on this one. Uh, there is a, a place, and it's in Missouri, uh, that is called Adam on Diamond. Um, and originally this was uh, the location or near the location of the Garden of Eden and uh, and this is from Doctrine and Covenants 107 53 to 54 three years previous to the death of Adam he called Seth, Enos, Canaan Mahalaleel, Jared, Enoch and Methuselah who were all high priests with the residue of his posterity who were righteous into the valley of Adam on Diamond and there bestowed upon them his last blessing. And the Lord appeared unto them, and they rose up and blessed Adam and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. So that is the first meeting of the Lord with uh, with some of the saints. This is early on in the history of mankind. Um, but uh, but that was his first meeting at Adam on Diamond. Um, what the scriptures prophesy of is, is another meeting where the Lord comes to Adam on Diamon. Uh, so this is Doctrine and Covenants section 116 uh, where the Lord reveals the location or reveals what uh, where Adam, Adam on Diamon is today. Spring Hill is named by the Lord Adam on Diamon because said he it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people or the ancient of days shall sit as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The ancient of days is a uh, is a name title for Adam, Father Adam. Um, so this is from the Millennial Messiah uh, by Elder Bruce R. McConkie. He, Christ, will come in private to his prophet and to the apostles then living. Those who have held keys and powers and authorities in all ages from Adam to the present will also be present. And further, all the faithful members of the church then living and all the faithful saints of all the ages past will be present it will be the greatest congregation of faithful saints ever assembled on planet Earth. It will be a sacrament meeting. It will be a day of judgment for the faithful of all ages. And it will take place in Davius County, Missouri, at a place called Adam on Diamond. So this is uh, a meeting where uh, heads of dispensations and others who have held keys will um, essentially uh, report to the Savior and uh, and to the dispensation heads and and uh, and the keys of leadership turned back over to the Savior and uh, a pretty exciting thing um, so that and, and chronologically I'm not positive but this uh, is, is likely the first um, appearance that kind of uh, gets the ball rolling for uh, for his coming in glory which which takes place a little later so I thought this was really interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a young adult devotional uh, given by uh, then president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, President Russell M. Nelson, and his wife, Sister Wendy Nelson. So at the end of her talk, Sister Nelson said this, So now a question as I conclude. What if you learned that the Savior had already returned to this earth? that he, as part of his second coming, had already met with some of his true followers in several marvelous large gatherings, gatherings about which the world, including CNN and the blogosphere, knew nothing. If you found out that the Savior was already on the earth, what would you desperately want to do today? And what would you be willing and ready to do tomorrow? I remember hearing that live and, uh, and was just floored. And I was wondering what she was trying to communicate if, if she was saying that this had happened. And if Hopefully you're making that connection there that what she's describing uh, sounds a lot like uh, a lot like Adam on Diamond and the, the meeting there. And so um, I, I tend to think she was giving a, a scenario of, of uh, just what she said. If you found out that that had happened, what would you desperately want to do today and tomorrow? And um, but 
and show how that could happen without the general knowledge of, of the uh, certainly the public and even many Latter-day Saints. So this is something to look forward to. Um, and if you get an invitation, uh, congratulations. And, and uh, please tell me about it if I didn't get one. <laughs> so uh, next I want to talk a little bit about uh, Zion, the New Jerusalem, and an appearance of the Savior that will be uh, in that place. Um, so the 10th article of faith says, we believe in the literal gathering of Israel. And this is almost in uh, in a chronology of, of events. Uh, so the literal gathering of Israel is happening now and in the restoration of the 10 tribes. Uh, not happened, but, but will shortly. That Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent. That has not happened, but it will shortly. That Christ will reign personally upon the earth and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. Uh, so those things, the Christ reigning personally and the earth receiving its paradi paradisiacal glory um, will come after uh, the restoration of the 10 tribes and, and Zion being built upon the American continent. So where is this Zion, the new Jerusalem? Let's look in Doctrine and Covenants 84, two through five. Yea, the word of the Lord concerning his church established in the last days for the restoration of his people, as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets, and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem, which city shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the western boundaries of the state of Missouri and dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith, Jr., and others with whom the Lord was well pleased. Verily, this is the word of the Lord, that the city, New Jerusalem, shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation. For verily, this generation shall not all pass away until an house shall be built unto the Lord, and a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. So the reference here to the, the city as well as the temple, the temple being uh, the center place um, with the rest of the city uh, around it. Uh, so the early saints um, were given a location and um, and wanted to to build this uh, because of mostly because of of their enemies, they weren't able to do it and and were driven from their homes and and their lands um, and and this I put on hold. Uh, but the Lord said that Zion would be redeemed, that that uh, his people would uh, reclaim their lands and and build up Zion. So from, from Doctrine and Covenants 103, 11 through 13, But verily I say unto you, I have decreed that your brethren which have been scattered shall return to the lands of their inheritances and shall build up the waste places of Zion. For after much tribulation, as I have said unto you in a former commandment, cometh the blessing. Behold, this is the blessing which I have promised after your tribulations, and the tribulations of your brethren, your redemption, and the redemption of your brethren, even their restoration to the land of Zion, to be established, no more to be thrown down. So that's something that, that the saints have been uh, anticipating and looking forward to for a, a long time. Um, Elder Orson F. Whitney said this, uh, once the saints had established uh, their headquarters in Salt Lake City and and had uh, settled the Intermountain West, uh, he says this, Will our mission end here in Utah? Is the state of Utah the proper monument of the Mormon people? Uh, this must have been, someone must have forgot to tell him that uh, we're Latter-day Saints and, uh, and not Mormons. But uh, anyway, um, is the state of Utah the proper monument of the Mormon people? No, the monument to Mormonism will stand in Jackson County, Missouri. There the great city will be built. There Zion will arise and shine, the joy of the whole earth. And there the Lord will come to his temple in his own time when his people shall have made the required preparation. So here is another appearance of the Savior, in addition to uh, Adam on um, an appearance to his people uh, to his temple. 
So this temple does not exist at this point. So we can safely say that uh, the second coming cannot happen uh, tomorrow or or just at any moment. Uh, that hasn't happened. He has not uh, come to his New Jerusalem temple. So uh, that tends to get people excited about uh, about going back to Missouri and and establishing Zion and building that temple. And that's awesome. And, and some will do that. But uh, this is what Brigham Young said about who is going back to Jackson County. Are we going back to Jackson County? Yes. When? As soon as the way opens up. Are we all going? Oh, no, of course not. The country is not large enough to hold our present numbers. Uh, the church in comparison now is obviously uh, much, much larger, and that's just not possible even for the saints in Utah uh, alone to inhabit uh, Jackson County. There's, there's not space. So he says this, a portion of the priesthood will go and redeem and build up the center stake of Zion. So Zion will fill North America eventually. Um, and there are other other Zion places that will be established and, and many of us will stay where we are and and build Zion cities there with, with New Jerusalem as the center stake. Um, but some will be invited to, to be of that portion of the priesthood that uh, that President Young was referring to and to uh, be involved in building up that center stake. And when that happens and when a great temple um, is built, uh, this is prophesied by the prophet Malachi um, and interesting how short of a book and seemingly irrelevant to, to a lot of people um, the book of Malachi, uh, but quoted by the angel Moroni when he appeared to uh, to Joseph Smith and, and elsewhere, a very significant um, book of scripture. So Malachi 3.1 says, And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So when that temple is complete and is dedicated, uh, the Savior will come, uh, as part of his second coming, will come to that temple and purify the sons of Moses and of Aaron and who are, are bearers of the priesthood and, um, and will prepare them to, uh, to become Zion and to, to transition into uh, a terrestrial existence um, and also call and prepare the 144,000 high priests who are to uh, go throughout the world and to gather in the elect from the four quarters of the earth who will come to the church of the firstborn. So that's a very significant event to have the Lord come to that temple. Um, and and I'm sure uh, the inhabitants of Zion then will will see him and will interact with him and be blessed by him and and receive further instructions and, and missions from there. So the New Jerusalem Temple um, has has been the site has been dedicated and and located. Um, this is what uh, it currently looks like today. There's not not much there. It's a, a a grass lot. These are are markers of the the different corners, the cornerstones, and so eventually. Um, that'll be more than this and, and be be built up. But you can see that we have some time that this needs to uh, this needs to take place before the Savior will come. A little more information on um, on the New Jerusalem, um, what it will be like. The, the uh, graphic here is actually a, a hand drawing. Uh, by Frederick G. Williams uh, at Joseph Smith's request and, and instruction. Uh, they, they had a plat of, of the city and were ready to build up the city. It's an interesting plan. Um, so this is what, uh, this is Doctrine and Covenants 45, 66 through 71, describing um, what this city will be like in the last days. 
And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall also be there. The terror of the Lord also shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it, and it shall be called Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. So this sounds to me like a place where uh, where we'd want to be, uh, to gather together to, to um, escape from the tribulation and uh, to have shelter from uh, from the, the storms and the wars um, and, the, and the chaos that will uh, occur when this um, at the time the, the city is established and it shall be said among the wicked let us not go up to battle against Zion for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible wherefore we cannot stand and the the citizens or the inhabitants of Zion are terrible to them because they're endowed with the power of God uh, to repel attacks of um, of wicked people and uh, those who would would fight against Zion um, they can't they can't fight against Zion because the, the power of Christ is is there and is being utilized by the inhabitants of Zion so it's terrible to the wicked and it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations and shall come to Zion singing with songs of everlasting joy. So that'll be awesome. Okay, so that's here in uh, North America. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the scriptures, uh, especially the Old Testament, um, that are dedicated to the the future of of the Jewish nation. So for the new Jerusalem, um, that is, uh, who kind of, who we're gathering so far has been mostly the tribe of Ephraim. Um, the 10 tribes that we call the lost 10 tribes and that, uh, the, um, f- the article of faith that we referred to earlier, uh, mentioned the restoration that we believe in the restoration of the 10 tribes. Uh, and that means that they will return and and be known, whereas now that they're not. Uh, here and there, we have people identified through patriarchal blessings to be uh, from one of those 10 tribes, but uh, all in all, uh, they have not been gathered. It's a very tiny percentage of of the church that are um, that are from those tribes, where it's primarily, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the sons of, of Joseph, uh, who have been gathered and who administer the church today. So um, the scriptures tell us that, tell us that uh, those 10 tribes will be, uh, will return and will come to Ephraim to receive their higher blessings, which would be the, the blessings of the Melchizedek priesthood, the blessings of the temple. Um, so that basically just leaves uh, the tribe of Judah and what will become of them. But again, the scriptures uh, talk extensively about their future. Um, so let's look at a, a visit of the Savior, an appearance of the Savior uh, that's often confused with just his his general second coming or coming in glory, um, but it is in fact a preliminary appearance. Um, so the we hear the word Armageddon. It's used in pop culture to kind of just mean the end of the world, and and it's really its meaning is lost to most people. Um, but in fact, it's a it's a valley uh, that's very fertile at this point, um, about sixty miles from Jerusalem. But really, this is kind of referring to the that whole area um, in and around Jerusalem. Uh, so this is. Uh, Elder Orson Pratt uh, from the Journal of Discourses, he says, So great will be the darkness resting upon Christendom, and so great the bonds of priestcraft with which they will be bound, that they will not understand, and they will be given up to the hardness of their hearts. Then will be fulfilled that saying, that the day shall come when the Lord shall have power over his saints, 
and the devil shall have power over his own dominion. He will give them up to the power of the devil, and he will have power over them, and he will carry them about as shaft before a whirlwind. He will gather up millions upon millions of people into the valleys around about Jerusalem in order to destroy the Jews after they have gathered. How will the devil do this? He will perform miracles to do it. The Bible says the kings of the earth and the great ones will be deceived by these false miracles. It says there shall be three unclean spirits that shall go forth working miracles, and they are spirits of devils. Where do they go? To the kings of the earth, and what will they do? Gather them up to battle unto the great day of God Almighty. Where? Into the valley of Armageddon. And this would be the greatest army uh, that's ever been assembled. 200 million soldiers and all of their armaments and weapons, the, the, especially the Old Testament scriptures, are very descriptive about uh, their weaponry and their appearance, that they uh, are are great and terrible and have uh, technology and have, uh, you know, just disastrous weaponry. Um, and their object is to destroy Jerusalem and, and the Jewish nation. And uh, obviously they'll be vastly larger uh, than, than the Jews gathered at Jerusalem. And so uh, the Jews will be, will be able to hold off uh, these armies um, mostly due to the two witnesses or, or two candlesticks, uh, two men um, that, according to Bruce R. McConkie, possess apostolic authority and power. Um, so it would be from uh, the Quorum of the Twelve or the First Presidency and and will stand and will miraculously defend uh, the the Jews um, for three and a half years. So we're not going to get in, into too much of this. There's lots of detail that's really, really interesting and um, I'm going to try and keep this a little bit a little bit short. But um, but anyway, they those two um, hold off those armies until eventually they're allowed to be uh, to be killed, and they lay in the streets for three and a half days, and uh, and then are resurrected in front of uh, of all of the those wicked soldiers who have laid siege to Jerusalem. Okay, so this is from Elder Charles W. Penrose um, in the Millennial Star. His Christ's next appearance after coming to his temple, and that's referring to the New Jerusalem will be among the distressed and nearly vanquished sons of Judah. At the crisis of their fate, when the hostile troops of several nations are ravaging the city and all the horrors of war are overwhelming the people of Jerusalem, he will set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, which will cleave and part asunder at his touch. Attended by a host from heaven, he will overthrow and destroy the combined armies of the Gentiles and appear to the worshiping Jews as the mighty deliverer and conqueror so long expected by their race. And while love, gratitude, awe, and admiration swell their bosoms, the Deliverer will show them the tokens of his crucifixion and disclose himself as Jesus of Nazareth, whom they had reviled and whom their fathers put to death. Then will unbelief depart from their souls, and the blindness in part which has happened unto Israel be removed. That'll be an amazing event as well, as a nation will be born in a day and and those uh, children of Judah will be converted to Jesus Christ and will uh, rebuild their temple which would be defiled by that time and uh, which doesn't exist at this time so still needs to be built and then defiled and then rebuilt um, and they uh, be redeemed and, and be uh, truly brothers and sisters to to us and and blessed members of the house of Israel. So this is Doctrine and Covenants 45, 48 through 53. And then shall the Lord set his foot upon this mount, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. And the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it, and the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly. And calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed, and they that have watched for iniquity shall be hewn down, 
and cast into the fire. And then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? Then they shall know that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. Then shall they lament because they persecuted their king. And after they're done lamenting, they will repent and and become uh, the covenant people that they were intended to be. And the first shall be last. So once those preliminary appearances have occurred, um, we don't know exactly the timing, but but it'll it'll be the next appearance will be Christ's uh, glorious return, what's considered His coming in glory uh, to the whole earth, where where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that He is the Christ. Uh, I love Elder Anderson's. Uh, his talk and imagery, he's compiled a lot of, of scriptures to uh, depict this this coming uh, in glory. This is from uh, April 2015 General Conference. He says, It will be breathtaking. The scope and grandeur, the vastness and magnificence will exceed anything mortal eyes have ever seen or experienced. In that day he will not come wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, but he will appear in the clouds of heaven clothed with power and great glory with all the holy angels. We will hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The sun and the moon will be transformed and stars will be hurled from their places. You and I or those who follow us. The saints from every quarter of the earth shall be quickened and caught up to meet him. And those who have died in righteousness, they too will be caught up to meet him in the midst of heaven. Then a seemingly impossible experience. All flesh, the Lord says, shall see me together. How it will happen, we do not know. But I testify it will happen, exactly as prophesied. We will kneel in reverence, and the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. And it shall be as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. Then the Lord, the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people. And that great coming in glory uh, is essentially the second coming. Um, and that ushers in uh, his millennial reign. Uh, so the Savior's return ushers in the millennium, a thousand years of peace. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 2911. For I will reveal myself from heaven with power and great glory, with all the hosts thereof, and dwell in righteousness, with men on earth a thousand years, and the wicked shall not stand. So as we uh, contemplate, and and I haven't talked a whole lot about um, about the tribulations and about the calamities um, that are foretold in the scriptures, um, there will be a part two to this video, and uh, we'll talk more about the signs of the times and um, and how to uh, kind of read those and put things together, um, and some of that can be frightening, and and some of it really is. Uh, is terrible uh, for the wicked. Um, but the end for the righteous is, well, not not the total end, but the, the, the thing to look forward to the most is, uh, is being part of this millennial reign, uh, which everyone who has lived on the earth will participate in to some degree. Um, many will be uh, still mortal and will, um, will have not died uh, but will be um, translated or uh, are changed into a, a terrestrial state that they can um, live without aging or becoming sick um, until they reach 100 years old and then be changed in the twinkling of an eye to a uh, resurrected immortal state. Um, so it truly is something to look forward to. Being in Zion is something to look forward to. Uh, and then uh, to have the whole world be subdued and um, and at peace um, is certainly something to look forward to and something that all the prophets through all ages of time have, have prophesied of and looked forward to. So what will the millennium be like? Uh, just to paint a, a, a little picture, this is Elder Orson Pratt. 
What a happy earth this creation will be when this purifying process shall come and the earth be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the great deep. What a change. Travel then from one end of the earth to, the, to another. You can find no wicked man, no drunken man, no man to blaspheme in the name of the great creator, no one to lay hold on his neighbor's goods and steal them, no one to commit whoredoms. And truly it will be uh, a wonderful and, and peaceful and blessed time. So that's um, that's what I wanted to, to just discuss here uh, to give us a, a good overview of of what the second coming is and and uh, those preliminary uh, appearances of the Savior and how they kind of tie in and and all of those together um, constitute the second coming. Um, so we can kind of get an idea of what what to expect and what to look for. But I think most of all to to just not think that. Uh, you know that we are shopping at the grocery store one day, and all of a sudden the heavens open up, and the and the Savior comes, and and you know everything burns and 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 destructions all kind of at once. That's just not an accurate picture. Um, so especially those who are paying attention and who uh, are Zion individuals um, will will be able to will look to this as. Um, with with delight and as a blessing, um, and we'll be looking to establish Zion, and we'll be the first to uh, have the Savior visit and appear. Um, and then after that, the rest of it won't uh, won't seem so bad. We'll already be with the Savior and 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 know Him, and essentially the millennium will begin um, for the saints, even though. Uh, the rest of the world is in commotion and, and is at war. Um, it'll be our opportunity to to gather uh, anyone who will in and uh, and and help them to be part of Zion as well. Um, anyway, thanks for for watching this. I, I hope it's been helpful. Um, I want to testify to you that Jesus Christ lives. He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He came as the babe of Bethlehem and was raised up on the cross uh, for the sins of all mankind and and died and buried and resurrected. And as he testified that he would come again, so he will. And I hope that you and I are among those who, uh, as, as in the parable of the ten virgins, who have extra oil and who are prepared to receive the bridegroom when he comes. That is my prayer and testimony that I leave with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.